As good as the Harry Potter films are, they cut a lot of detail from the books. I already made a top 10 differences between the books and the movies, which I'll link below, but that only scratched the surface. There are so many more differences, so let's count down another 10. Number 10, Peeves the Poltergeist. Peeves is a troublemaker who pops up countless times in every book. He causes trouble everywhere he goes, from throwing water balloons at kids, knocking down cabinets, smashing vases, upending potions, singing loudly, and so on. He's the arch enemy of the Hogwarts caretaker, Argus Filch, who desperately tries to get rid of him. In the films, however, he was never mentioned. He was actually cast, and they shot a scene with him in the first film, but director Chris Columbus cut it not only from the film, but the deleted scenes as well. This is because he was unhappy with the special effects of the ghosts and poltergeists. It's a real shame, because the school just seems too peaceful without the poltergeist's presence. Number 9. The Opening Scene In the films, the story opens with Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Hagrid delivering Harry to Number 4 Privet Drive. Here we started out with the Wizarding World, but in the books, we actually started out with the Muggle World, specifically with Vernon Dursley. We follow him throughout his day and see the Wizarding World from a Muggle perspective. This changes everything because just like Vernon, we're clueless about the Wizarding World. All that both Vernon and the audience knows is that Harry Potter is a wizard. We don't know anything about the Wizarding World itself, and we see strange things start to happen. It really draws you in and makes you want to read more. The first chapter might be one of the most important parts of the book, especially in a big series like this. Had the first chapter started out how the films did, it might not have been able to draw so many people in, and the series might not have been as successful. Number 8. Draco's Dark Mark In the films, we see Draco's Dark Mark. It's plain and simple that he was branded with the mark of the Death Eaters. I was chosen! In the books, however, it's never shown nor stated that Draco was branded. It was hinted at like in Borgen and Burks when he threatened Borgen, but Rowling has stated that she purposefully never showed his mark. She wanted to leave it up to the audience's imagination. You are brilliant. Number 7. Ages those that have only seen the films would be shocked at how young James, Lily, Snape, Lupin, Sirius, Peter Pettigrew, and Petunia Dursley were. In the films, they look like they're in their mid to late 40s. In the books, however, Lily and James died when they were only 21. This would also make Snape, Lupin, Sirius, Pettigrew, and Petunia in their early to mid 30s during the series. This is a huge difference, especially for Lily and James. It makes their deaths so much more tragic as they died so young. It's also crazy to think that Harry Harry was only 4 years younger than they were when they died during the events of the Deathly Hallows. Number 6. The Battle of the Department of Mysteries The films did a top-notch job with this scene, but most of what we saw in the films was very different from the book. In the books, we explore the Department of Mysteries so much more and learn so many more secrets. When they first enter, there are many identical doors, and behind each is a different division of the Department of Mysteries. This includes prophecies, love, death, space, brains, and time. We see Dumbledore's army interact with these sections and even see Ron get attacked by one of the brains. I actually made a video about the Department of Mysteries that goes into more detail if you're interested, which I'll link below. Number 5. The Elder Wand In both the books and the films, we learn that the Elder Wand is the most powerful wand ever made, and one of the three Deathly Hallows. Its allegiance bounces from person to person throughout the last two books, but ultimately, it ends up being loyal to Harry. After the Battle of Hogwarts ends, however, this is where the movies and books differ. In the movies, Harry snaps the wand and throws it over the edge of the castle. In the books, however, Harry does not do this. He instead uses it to fix his own wand, which was snapped earlier in the book. Then, after talking with Dumbledore's portrait, he decides to place the Elder Wand back in Dumbledore's tomb where Voldemort had taken it in the first place. This way, when Harry died a natural death, the wand's power would be broken, as Dumbledore had originally intended it to do. To be honest, this is one of the few times I like the movie better than the book. With it still being out there, there are so many flaws. If anyone simply disarmed Harry, they would be the true master of the wand. And when you have a job like being an order, constantly fighting dark wizards, no matter how good you are, you're bound to be disarmed. And I know most fans don't consider the cursed child to be canon, but Rowling says it is. Stop, stop, stop. So this makes an even bigger flaw. Delphi, Voldemort and Bellatrix's daughter, disarms Harry in the end, which would mean she, the daughter of Voldemort, is the true master of the Elder Wand. No. No. Number 4. Hagrid being a giant. 
The films did a great job with Hagrid, but they cut so much out. The biggest thing being that Hagrid is a half giant. It's very briefly mentioned, if at all. Hagrid says that he takes after his mom, and that she left when he was around the age of three. He then mentions how small his dad was, so we hardly got anything, and anyone who hadn't read the books probably would not have picked up on that. In the books, it goes into much more detail, Hagrid being publicly humiliated when Rita Skeeter wrote an article about it. There's also a whole nother arc where Dumbledore sent Hagrid and Maxime, another half giant to go up in the mountains to recruit other giants for the Order of the Phoenix after Voldemort returned. We saw a tiny glimpse of this arc when he came back with his half-brother Grog, but again, I feel as though those that have only seen the movies might not put together that Hagrid actually is a giant himself. It's only those that have read the books that will understand that. I've seen this countless times in my comment section on my Hagrid video. Many people that had only seen the movies didn't put together that because Grog was his half-brother, he himself is a giant, because it was never specifically said in the films. Number 3. Ariana Dumbledore This was a huge thing left out in the movies. In the books, Aberforth told Harry, Ron, and Hermione the story of how she died during a duel between himself, Dumbledore, and Grindelwald. We learned more about her past, and even more about Dumbledore and Grindelwald's relationship. This is an even bigger thing to leave out now that we're covering the Fantastic Beasts era. Those that have only seen the movies only have a brief mention of her character. That's your sister Ariana, isn't it? She died very young, didn't she? Not only does Fantastic Beasts reveal that she was an Obscurial, but this flashback also plays a huge part in the relationship and downfall of Dumbledore and Grindelwald, which is arguably the biggest part of the Fantastic Beasts films. It's a real shame that they cut this part out. I think had they known that Fantastic Beasts was going to be made, they would have made sure to incorporate Ariana's whole backstory. Number 2. Neville The films did an excellent job transitioning Neville from a dorky scared boy to a straight up hero, but in the films they cut out a huge part of his character. The prophecy that was ultimately about Harry and Voldemort was very close to being about Neville instead of Harry. Both were born as the seventh month dies, or at the end of July, and both had parents that defied Voldemort three times, just as the prophecy says. Neville was very close to becoming the chosen one. The only reason that he wasn't was because Voldemort decided to mark Harry as his equal rather than Neville when he went to Godric's Hollow to try and kill Harry. Imagine if the series was called Neville Longbottom and the Philosopher's Stone. Neville Longbottom and the Goblet of Fire, or Neville Longbottom and the Deathly Hallows. That went well. And finally, number one, the final fight between Harry and Voldemort. The films went all over the place with this fight, from up in a castle, transitioning to a fist fight, falling off the side of the castle, flying, and finally ending up in the courtyard. Then, when Harry finally defeats Voldemort, he blows away into a thousand pieces. This is truly awful, and one of the worst things that the films messed up. In the books, the fight was simple. They fought in the Great Hall with everyone watching. And then, when Voldemort was beaten, his dead body toppled over and laid on the ground motionless. This is how it should always be. He should have died a mortal and simple death, because ultimately, that's all he was no matter how hard he tried to fight it. He was just like everyone else. Voldemort falling apart into a thousand pieces makes him seem like he was different and like he was special. It completely contradicts what Rowling was trying to convey. Also, the whole point of him being in the Great Hall for his final downfall is that everyone watches him die. He's humiliated in his last few seconds of life, whereas in the films, he dies with no one watching. He isn't humiliated. It's a real shame that they made him die like a god, rather than in the simple mortal way in which it was supposed to happen. Thank you so much for watching guys, you can follow me on social media, links for that will be down below. If you like this video, make sure you press that subscribe button to help grow the channel. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, check out my Patreon. Again, thank you so much for watching and look out for more great videos on the way.